Greetings and welcome to the Simon Property Group third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow a formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Tom Ward, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you, Tom. You may begin. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Presenting on today's call are David Simon, Chairman, Chief Executive Officer and President, and Brian McDane, Chief Financial Officer. A quick reminder that statements made during this call may be deemed forward-looking statements within the meaning of the safe harbor of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, and actual results may differ materially due to a variety of risks, uncertainties, and other factors. We refer you to today's press release and our SEC filings for a detailed discussion of the risk factors related to those forward-looking statements. Please note that this call includes information that may be accurate only as of today's date. Reconciliations of non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures are included within the press release and the supplemental information in today's Form 8K filing. Both the press release and the supplemental information are available on our IR website at investors.simon.com. Our conference call this morning will be limited to one hour. For those who would like to participate in the question and answer session, we ask that you please respect our request to limit yourself to one question. I am pleased to introduce David Simon. Uh, good morning, everybody. And I'm pleased uh, with our financial and operational performance in the third quarter. Uh, we saw increased leasing volumes, occupancy gains, and uh, total resa- retail sales volumes. Demand for our space from a broad spectrum of tenants is strong and steady, and we continue to strengthen our uh, unique retail uh, real estate platform through our growing development and redevelopment um, pipeline. This combined with our A-rated balance sheet really sets us apart and allows us to focus on the future. We raised our dividend again to $2.10. We're now at our historical high, overcoming the um, uh, arbitrary, capricious closing of our real estate during COVID. We have a low payout ratio. I'm going to now turn it over to Brian, who will cover our third quarter results and full year guidance in more detail. Brian? Thank you, David, and good morning. Real estate FFO was $3.05 per share in the third quarter compared to $2.91 in the prior year, a 4.8% growth rate. Domestic and international operations had a very good quarter and contributed $0.15 of growth, driven by a 3% increase in lease income. Third quarter funds from operation were one. $0.07 $0.07 billion, or $2.84 per share, as compared to $1.2 billion, or $3.20 per share last year. Third quarter results include $0.13 cents per share of non-cash net loss and fair value adjustments from the mark-to-market on the Clay Pierre exchangeable bonds we issued in November of 23, which mature in November of 2026. The non-cash loss on derivative is due to the outperformance of Clay Pierre's stock price, which increased 18% during the third quarter. As a result of the stock appreciation, the market value of our Clay Pierre investment increased by approximately $400 million during the third quarter. OPI was an $0.08 cent loss in the quarter due to reduced discretionary spending by the lower income consumer at two Spark brands, and also from the loss of income from ABG in the prior year due to the sale of our interest earlier this year. As a reminder, the prior year results include $0.32 per share in non-cash gains from the partial sale of our ownership in Spark in the third quarter of 23. Domestic NOI increased 5.4% year-over-year for the quarter due to continued leasing momentum Resilient consumer spending and operational excellence delivered the results exceeding our plan for the quarter. Portfolio NOI, which includes our international properties at constant currency, grew 5% for the quarter. 
Malls and outlet occupancy at the end of the third quarter was 96.2%, an increase of 1% compared to the prior year. The mill's occupancy was 98.6% at the end of the quarter. Average base minimum rent for the malls and outlets increased 2.3% year over year, and the mills increased 4.5% year over year. Leasing momentum continued across the portfolio. We signed approximately 1,200 leases for 4 million square feet in the quarter. Through the first nine months of 2024, we have signed more than 3,900 leases for 15 million square feet, which is expected to generate more than $1 billion of revenue. We have an additional 1,800 deals in our pipeline, including renewals, for more than $600 million of revenue. We continue to see strong, broad-based demand from the retail community, including continued strength for many categories. Reported retailer sales per square foot was $737 for the mall and premium outlets combined and was up approximately 1% year over year, excluding two retailers. Importantly, total sales volumes, excluding those same two retailers, were up approximately 1.5% year over year. At the end of the quarter, our occupancy cost was 12.8%. Turning to new development and redevelopment, we opened Tulsa Premium Outlets on August 15th at 100% leased, and we've also, we also opened a significant expansion at Busan Premium Outlets in South Korea in September. At the end of the quarter, new development and redevelopment projects were underway across all platforms in the U.S. and internationally, with our share of net cost of $1.3 billion at a blended yield of 8%. Turning to other platform investments, our OPI results for the third quarter at Spark underperformed as the lower income consumer continues to be more cautious in their spending. We first highlighted the inflationary impact in the second half of 2022 relative to this consumer. Performance was below expectations at Forever 21 in Reebok. Spark and JCPenney did, however, record sequential improvements in comp sales during the third quarter, which sets these brands up well for the important upcoming holiday season. We are not sitting still, and we expect to have some positive announcements by year-end with respect to these businesses. Turning to our balance sheet, during the quarter, we amended and extended our $3.5 billion supplemental revolving credit facility for three years on existing terms. We also issued $1 billion in senior notes uh, with a term of 10 years and a 4.75% interest rate. This was clearly good timing on our part. During the first nine months of the year, we completed refinancings of 14 property mortgages for a total of approximately $1.3 billion at an average rate of 6.13%. We ended the quarter with approximately $11.1 billion of liquidity and at the end of the quarter, on Octo- uh, subsequent to the end of the quarter on October 1st, we repaid our last remaining unsecured maturity for 2024 of $900 million. Um, we, con- we constantly innovate in both our physical and digital worlds to create world-class convenience for our shoppers and drive incremental sales for our brand partners. In continuing this effort and building upon the success of shop premium outlets, we rebranded our digital marketplace, Shop Simon, to take advantage of all of our assets, including shopper email lists totaling over 25 million customers. The expanded and rebranded digital marketplace adds on sale and discounted merchandise while continuing to offer outlet products from leading brands. This is the next phase in our journey to create the ultimate omnichannel experience. We also launched a new nationwide marketing campaign, Meet Me at the Mall. The campaign celebrates the shopping mall's continued cachet as the go-to destination for all generations. Turning to our dividend, today we announced our dividend of $2.10 per share for the fourth quarter, a year-over-year increase of 10.5%. The dividend is payable on December 30th. This is the fourth consecutive quarter we have increased our dividend and the dividend is now back to our pre-pandemic record high. Finally, turning to guidance, we are affirming our guidance range of $12.80 to $12.90 per share, 
which excludes 14 cents per share year-to-date impact of the non-cash loss and fair value adjustments from the mark-to-market on the Clay Pierre exchangeable bonds, which prior to the third quarter was only a one cent net non-cash loss, but is now 14 cents and needed to be highlighted. With that, thank you for your time today. David and I are now available for your questions. Operator? Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. Our first question is from Steve Stockwell with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, uh, David and Brian. You know, it sounds like you've got great momentum on the leasing front and with the portfolio, you know, north of 96%. I'm just curious how you guys are um, attacking the uh, lease expiration schedule over the next couple of years and whether you feel like pricing power is moving materially in your favor, uh, just given the interplay with, you know, sales being a little bit flat, but uh, obviously there being strong demand for high quality retail space. Yeah, Steve, I'll, I'll answer that um, simplistically, I guess. Um, I would say that our job is to continue to improve the merchandise mix at our, uh, at our real estate. And um, so it's, it's more than it's, – it's, it's a lot more than just what rent you can charge. It's really, you know, what is the right – Retail, retailer, tenant, um, you know, et cetera. What's the right mix for that property? And we take more of a um, holistic approach to um, to how we remerchandise centers. We're we're still undergoing significant remerchandising across the portfolio because we're seeing better. Retailers. When I say retailers, it could be restaurants, et cetera. I'm, I'm using that as a generic term. We're seeing a lot uh, more interesting and better retailers that are interested in our portfolio. So we need to take advantage of that, and um, and that's the focus. So you know, obviously, supply and demand. I mean, you know, construction costs are you know up 60 percent from pre-pandemic numbers. I mean, pretty staggering number. And we're basically one of the few that can build and overcome that. Um, So there is no real new supply. And that does put us in a a positive light. But our job is to make the properties better um, and, and not just focus on you know, the highest rent per square foot we can get. So with that, you know, we have a balanced approach. Um, obviously, we think we still have growth as um, as um, leases expire or we bring in new tenants. Uh, but I don't, I really, I really don't like the term pricing power. I really don't like to focus on that. You know, it's just how do you continue to make the portfolio better is really the, the, the number one focus uh, for our team. We just literally uh, had three-day marathon session. Um, you know, we go property by property with our leasing folks. Um, it, you know, the, we did the malls this week. We'll do uh, the outlets and mills next week. And, it, and if you participated in it, I think I offered – somebody one time down the road to, to who was it? Alex probably. Yeah. Alex is the only guy that would want to sit through it. Uh, but if, if you sat through it, you know, the primary focus is how do we make the property better? We still have work to do there. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, when you do that, you'll get the, um, you'll get the property growth that we're, we're all looking for. Um, so I, I would characterize it that way, Steve. The good news is supply and demand's in our favor. 
we have the capital to invest in our portfolio to make it better, um, overcome the um, unbelievable rise in construction costs when you think about it, and um, you know, and that's the focus. All right. Well, I'm free next week if you want me to sit in on the meeting. Thanks. Uh, you, you're more than welcome. I, you get to choose outlets or mills. All right. Let Tom know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Our next question is from Caitlin Burroughs with Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, David, you mentioned a growing development and redevelopment pipeline. I was wondering if you can go through like how deep this opportunity is for Simon's portfolio now, considering all that you've already done. Um, to what extent is there still potential for anchor replacement or other retail redevelopments, and then also the larger mixed-use projects? Uh, yeah, I think that continues, Caitlin, to be you know a huge focus for us. So I would. Um, our pipeline is probably around $4 uh, billion right now. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to do all of it, but, you know, we have massive mixed-use um, um, opportunities ahead of us, and, and we still don't, you know, we still don't have all the anchors. Um, we still don't have all the anchors um, redeveloped. The way we want to, um, so you know, uh, we we have opportunities at you know like a Barton Creek or you know um, you know go down the line if you if you looked at kind of some of the Sears pa Passion Valley is a great opportunity where we're going to get the J C Penney space back and uh, probably do about a five hundred million dollar redevelopment between retail and mixed use. Our residential pipeline, um, as an example of that, is, is over a billion dollars today. And without including kind of the, you know, the Fashion Valleys or the Barton Creeks of the world that uh, we think could do residential. And we continue to see, um, you know, an interesting relationship between residential development uh, adjacent or part of our, you know, existing retail uh, format. They, they they actually go hand in glove. It's very encouraging to see. I think if um, you listen to Don Wood, he'll tell you the same thing. So, so that is exciting. We're going full steam ahead. Um, as you know, that supply, it's probably, you know, in certain markets been oversupplied, but the reality is nobody building now. And if you think how we're looking at it, it, it's going to take two to three to four years. And as we bring these on, there'll be no new supply. And I think that'll put us in, a, in an advantageous, advantageous situation. So uh, long story short, say $4 billion, and, you know, roughly a third of that is probably ready. Uh, let's go on office. <laughs> let's go on office. <laughs> But, but some office, like for instance, we're, we just approved a deal, and I don't think it's in our, in our AK, but we just approved a deal at Clear Fork, which is in Fort Worth, you know, a, a kind of a newer center, um, and we just approved a deal with our partner to build an office and retail on the ground floor. The office is going to be, I don't know if I can say it, but, but basically, um, you know, we don't. Have, it's it's not big. It's I don't know, 50,000 square feet, and Wells is going to take you know, the majority of it. Um, and so we'll still do smatterings of those kind of projects. Um, you know, as, as we um, as as we go forward. But you know, building a big spec office out of out of our uh, out of our uh, um, pipeline. Got it. And just to confirm, I know in there you were talking about retail office, uh, well, not so much office, and the multifamily. You mentioned at one point in there overbuilding. That was on the residential side, correct? Correct. 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 Yeah. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeffrey Spector with Bank of America. Please proceed with your question. Great. Thank you. Maybe just, you know, uh, following up on the first question topic, David, your comments on merchandising mix. 
you know, maybe something else that is sometimes overlooked. I know, you know, you, you guys talked about your, the omni-channel experience and what you're doing there. Meet me at the mall. Can you expand a little bit on some of the key initiatives that the company is doing to, again, engage customers, bring them to the centers, and how this may evolve over, over the next few years? I know, of course, this holiday season you have some, some great programs. Thank you. Sure, sure. So um, I would say, Jeff, that, um, you know, the mall continues to be a, a, a unique gathering place. And, um, you know, we get, I think we all get too focused on whether it's, you know, enclosed or has a roof on it. I mean, it really, it, to me, it really doesn't matter. It's kind of what is the best retail project in that trading area. Um, and um, we believe that, and if you talk to, you know, really new and exciting companies like a Sheehan um, uh, or other um, skims or, you know, kind of the, the new wave of retailers slash marketplaces, they all believe in, you know, in our product. And so, and we're seeing a, rejuvenation of uh, the younger consumers wanting to hang out at the mall. And I think it's our obligation, uh, both for us, um, you know, um, and our investors, et cetera, and also for the retailers to really highlight that. Now, you know, we don't have unlimited budgets, you know, like uh, the tech companies, right? Um, but we try to do the best we can to reinforce that, hey, this is, you know, this is cool. Now, at the same time, you know, digital um, is important, right? So 14, 15 percent uh, of, you know, uh, of commerce is digital, and we think we can play in a role in that. We think the best way to do that is through Shop Simon. We made sure we had proof of concept before, you know, we put kind of our our brand on it. If you remember, it started uh, Shop Premium Outlets. Um, uh, we floundered around until we partnered with um, uh, Michael Rubin and RGG. We've created, we hired some, you know, uh, top-notch talent there. We're building our marketplace. We had proof of concept, and then we decided to rebrand it under Shop Simon. So, you know, we do think, and then ultimately this will will add, will hang a loyalty product on that, which will be important. Um, and then ultimately uh, we have Simon Search, which will hang on that, um, and you know we'll end up with you know, shift from store, pick up, uh, pick up at the mall, et cetera. So it's the flywheel is starting to fill itself out. Uh, but in the meantime, we want to reaffirm the positive nature that our product means to the community, means to our retailers, you know, as we, as we, go, as we grow on. And we can't ignore digital because you know, let's face it, it's around that 14, 15%. Not growing the way it used to, but, you know, we have to assume it might. So we have to play in there. And I think with Shop Simon, we've got the right product, our retailer relationships and faith they have in us uh, gives me confidence. We have the right team. We have the right partner. And RGG, I think, gives us confidence that, um, you know, we'll continue to uh, Great real value out of that platform, but it's not overnight. It takes time, it takes investment, uh, prudent investment, and that's and that's what we're doing. Great, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Craig Mailman with City. Please proceed to your question. Hey, good morning. Um, Maybe just to follow up on the, the Shop Simon concept, David, um, you know, as you guys are looking to re-merchandise malls and, you know, there could be some more anchor fallout over time. I mean, is, is the idea here to 
hopefully get this up and running to where you guys can convert part of the mall to last mile distribution and be able to, you know, bring in that logistics angle to your business um, to help your retailers and also be able to monetize it or, or am I reading a little bit too much into it? Well, uh, you know, I do think there is absolutely a role that we can play in search at your local store that happens to be in our center. Uh, and then, and then maybe there's a distribution angle and certainly, um, pick up in stores an angle that we can help facilitate with our retailers. Uh, whether we'll be, build a mini distribution center or not, I mean, we look at those things and there's possibilities um, of certain retailers uh, or certain centers that, you know, you know, we might be able to do a micro or, you know, mini distribution facility. You know, we're also looking at um, last mile in the power area because obviously that's you know going going um crazy and that you know there is well the, the, our real estate is unbelievably well located and it it does um you know it is not um you know we're not out in the hinterlands and last mile is very important and we usually have real estate that's you know, A, A1A. So, you know, there, there's possibilities. It's not going to be dominant or whatever. It'll be selective, but there are, there are potential possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Greg McGinnis with Scotia Bank. Please proceed with your question. <clears throat> hey, good morning. Um, I guess congrats on the strong leasing quarter crossing. 96% in occupancy ahead of Yeah. Oh, you um, coming up there. Go or you're functionally full. Well, you know, look, I think we can still increase our occupancy, but also um, beyond occupancy, and I said earlier, which really we're really focused on merchandise mix. So, um, and, um, but we still have room to grow our occupancy, but, uh, but more important is that, you know, bringing in the right tenants uh, in the right center, um, in the right location. That, that's a huge focus for us. Um, but we still think we have plenty of opportunity to grow our occupancy. Okay, thanks. And just one quick one on FFO for share guidance. We're trying to better understand the successful year contribution from real estate as opposed to some of the noise that's generated by other platform investments. Are you still anticipating around zero cents from OPI, or is that lower now and maybe offset by better real estate um, performance? Greg, it's Brian. I think we now think the, the OPI contribution is going to be a minus five to minus ten for the year, but it's being offset by you know significant improvement in the in the real estate uh, FFO estimation. Okay, so so but, overall, so then we, we expect it to improve in the fourth quarter for sure. Right, but I guess and, overall, I think my my takeaway is that the real estate business guidance would be increased or uh, if it were standalone. Yeah, if we, if, you know, OPI is, uh, you're breaking up, I don't know if it's our phone or yours, but OPI has been a drag this year from an SSO point of view. Now, remember, we essentially have four assets in OPI, okay? We have our investment in RGG, we have our investment in Jamestown, uh, we have our interest in Spark and and J.C. Penny. When you put it all together, we have positive EBITDA in those business, you know, of a meaningful amount. But again, when you own an interest in a retailer, you've got lots of depreciation, lots of expenses that end up hurting FFO, but not necessarily the EBITDA line. So I, I just want everybody to put in that perspective. And again, I would also mention to you that you know our investment 
in both Penny and Spark is de minimis at this point. You know, we have a little bit more investment in RGG and Jamestown, but the size of our company, you know, uh, is, you know, you know, is the right thing to do. So with that said, and Brian said in our call, well, we are still not standing still on our retail side, which is Penny and Spark. And I do think we'll have some positive announcements with respect to those businesses, uh, you know, near year end or early, early 25. Uh, so we're working hard on that. But the bottom line is it has been a drag this year. Uh, um, part of that drag was because we sold ABG, uh, so we lost that income that we thought that we, when we gave you our budget, we weren't anticipating. We're extremely happy with that sale. So that was the right thing to do at the right time. Um, and, um, but so we tackled one opportunity. We're tackling the next. Uh, we, we view RGG and Jamestown as long-term investments at this point. Obviously that can change. Um, but we view those as long-term investments. And, um, um, again, so, you know, and if you go back in history, which I think is important, you know, when we got into the retail business, it was the right thing to do at that particular time. You know, we are less, um, you know, Given today's time, it's probably not the right thing to do, and that's why we haven't done a retail investment in a few years, four years. So we're smart, we get it, but we're focused in, you know, we, 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 we have an investment that's worth something with no capital in it, so our job is to, is to make it better, and that's what we're focused on. A little, Great, you. you know, divert, a diversion from what you wanted, but I figured <laughs> I'd give you the, I'd give you the full story. Okay. All the colors appreciated. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Greg. Our next, our next question is from Ron Camden with Morgan Stanley. Ron. Looks like we lost Ron. Our next question is from Alexander Goldfarb with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Hey, uh, morning, morning out there, David. And yeah, I'll I'm happy to coordinate with Tom and Steve on uh, sitting in on one of those uh, leasing sessions uh, with you. Uh, well, so, well, we'll do it. You might, you might, uh, you you'll either be fully impressed or you'll you'll uh, the detail might overwhelm you. So we'll see. <laughs> uh, I, I look forward to being overwhelmed. So question, David, uh, just getting back to the commentary on the 96% uh, plus least performance of the portfolio and the comments that you've made about, you know, the opportunity in the malls. Uh, as you look at the bottom tier, for a long time you talked about the bottom 20% driving cash flow to reinvest in the top malls. But given how competitive the retail environment has become, lack of new supply, are you seeing new opportunities in your bottom 20% of malls that previously you would have just harvested for cash flow, but because of the changing uh, landscape, you now see opportunities that didn't exist a few years ago? You know, that's a, a good, um, that's a really interesting question and a good point. I think based on if you asked everybody on the um, on um, you know the the last three days of, of you know the mall portfolio, we absolutely you know not every asset in the bottom tier. And again, we, I don't I don't like that phrase, but you know but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, I would tell you if you talk to our team. You know, our, our leaders in that area, you know, John Murphy and Eric Soddy, uh, Rick, God love him, still loves to, you know, go through it, um, and John Ruley, et cetera. I would say to you, 
one of the real opportunities for this company is to um, improve the bottom 20. Um, and because you're right, there's no new supply in those markets. Um, you know, just like, you know, human nature, we always want to work on the sexy stuff, right? So I do think um, there's a real potential to improve that because in many cases we're the only game in town and, um, and given lack of supply and our ability to reinvest, I do think we can make, you know, real strides in the, in the, in the bottom tier, you know, again, not every asset, but you know, the majority plus of them. So that's a big focus going into 25 uh, without question. Thank you. Sure. Our next question is from Flores Van Dykem with Compass Point. Please proceed with your question. Good hey, morning, guys. Uh, thanks. Um, question uh, on the on the on the leasing. By the way, I, I thought the uh, the response to Alex's question was was fascinating. By the way, because I, we believe that you know the the B malls or the lower quality malls uh, financing might finally be coming back to that mar- market now too, but. Um, Maybe if you can talk about your SNO pipeline. Last quarter, you mentioned it was 250 basis points. How has that moved? I saw that Hermes just opened up its store in in Phipps. And what percentage of that SNO pipeline is luxury in in your view? Is it is it meaningful? And 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 you know, are there other Phipps type luxury projects planned in the portfolio going forward? Yeah, let me let me yeah, uh, interesting question again, and I would say I have it right in front of me, or I, I used to. But here, um, okay, so we have, um, we've executed 75 new luxury deals covering 208,000 square feet. Um, and we have another 47 out for signature. So that's kind of the total out there at this point. Uh, but again, we're we're increasing that you know every day as we speak. So yeah, we we even though you know the sales for certain brands has slowed in that area, they um, are continuing to commit. And for us, as you know, I mean the build out and the and the time. The time for for um, for those retailers to open is probably, you know, compared to kind of a traditional retailer, is longer. But we've got it. We've got a very impressive. Um, we've got a very impressive pipe on that um, with a lot of square footage that will open over the next few years and growing to this day. And Flores, the, the sign but not open uh, number is about 300 basis points. And importantly here, though, as you've heard David talk about multiple times, this is about merchandising mix. So this isn't all incremental. We're swapping out underperforming retailers with better retailers. And we do have retailers making commitments well into the future in that number as well. Thanks, Gus. Okay, thanks. Our next question is from Vince, Vince Tabone with Green Street. Hi, good morning. Um, could you provide some color on the cadence of stabilizations for the development and redevelopment pipeline? Specifically, if you could share, you know, how much incremental NOI you're expecting in 25 from the pipeline on a net basis, you know, all the openings this year and next, offset by any, you know, disrupt or downtime with, with new projects. Uh, that would be, you know, super helpful for forecasting. Yeah, Vince, we, we think we're ultimately going to deliver about 30% of the portfolio uh, investment in 25. So, you know, against the 8% on lever yield, I think you can, you can back into the estimated income contribution from that, those, those data points. And is that like an average then, or I should think of that as like 30% on average will stabilize. Cause like stuff that, you know, delivered the third quarter, for example, this year is obviously going to be, you know, creative to 25. Just wanted to clarify that point. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a decent run rate for expectation uh, relative to our development business. About a third probably stabilizes. Great. That's helpful. And if I can squeeze in one more follow-up, can you just provide a quick description of any, you know, mall redevelopment started in the quarter? I saw the spend increase some, but, you know, no description in the release of the, of the project. Uh, so we started a, uh, a resi project at Briarwood, um, and we started a redevelopment at Tacoma. Those were the two big ones uh, in the quarter that really, that we added to the, the pipeline. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Juan Sanabria with EMO Capital Markets. Good morning. Uh, just given where we are with the election next week, just curious on your thoughts on potential positives or negatives that could come out depending on uh, which side wins. And, and, and I guess specifically also, what would be your view on tariffs? Is that positive or negative for Simon's business as a whole? Thank you. Well, look, I, I, I am of the view that, um, you know, we, we, we should, we, look, I'm of the view that um, CEOs, whether they're founders, you know, kind of like the way I feel, or, you know, up through the ranks, ought to stay out of politics, Okay. That's not to say that they shouldn't lobby um, because, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of things that go on in Washington that may affect the company, and that's their job. So I'm go- and, and I'm not here to endorse, kind of take the Washington Post view that, you know, that uh, we have to be ready for, for all sorts of outcomes. Um, I do think because of – you know the the um, you know the vitriol that's occurring. You know, and and that's why we're cautious. You know, with respect to kind of our guidance for the fourth quarter, is that it's an uncertain time, right? So, not only here domestically uh, and here globally, but um, uh, beyond that, I really am not going to get into that. I think. Um, I think the decision ought to be left to the to individuals. People like me should stay out of trying to influence, you know, uh, the people. The people are what matter, and um, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, we'll be prepared. You know, there's basically six potential outcomes, right? If I had to do it right. Uh, you know, you could have a Democratic sweep, you could have a Republican sweep, and then you can, I uh, used to be able to do that, you know, but, you know, three times, two, I think it's six, right? So, so you could have six possible outcomes, you know, we've got to be ready for all six. And I'm not going to tell you what outcome I want. I don't think it's my job. Uh, I do think it's my job to lobby once we understand you know, what's happening, like, you know, maybe on a de minimis rule or et cetera, that hurts our retailers or hurts our, uh, you know, consumer. Um, um, but, um, but beyond that, um, you know, if I could, if I could be so, uh, you know, I don't know. I want to, I don't know if I should say this. It sounds, you know, guys like me, who, who knows what guys like me means, but we ought to like just let the people decide without this uh, overbearing influence from from outside people. That that's my personal kind of view, and um, we just need to be ready for six possible outcomes. Fair enough. Understood. Thanks, David. Thank you. Our next question is from Michael Goldsmith with UBS. Good morning. Thanks a lot for taking my question. Maybe just tying some of the themes that we've heard from the call together. Your occupancy crossed 96%. You feel like there's more room to grow. You're focused on merchandising and being selective. And it also looks like your expiring rights for 26 maturities are below 25 by 6 or 7%. So just maybe throwing it together, does that give you confidence or visibility to sustainable mid-single digit NOI growth over the next couple of years? 
Uh, hey, Michael, it's Brian. Yes, we do believe that we will have the, the momentum in Atlanta Y will continue. Uh, all of the things you highlighted are certainly part of it, plus the investment of capital back into the business. As you've heard David say, we will be opening up projects in 25, 26, and 27 that, that there's going to be no new supply, and so that is certainly going to support our growth as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question is from Linda Sai with Jeffries. Thanks for taking my question. Um, can you provide some color on the quarter over quarter improvement in domestic and portfolio NOI? And then how do you think about NOI growth in 25 as an initial guidepost? Uh, well, Linda, I, I think, you know, the quarter we continue to see rent growth, occupancy growth, conversion of temp to perm. I think you, you see the quarter reflecting us executing on our business plan uh, to a high degree. And, and as I just said, I think we carry that momentum, you know, into next year as we continue to execute. Any color on 25, though, in terms of the same level continuing? Well, Linda, we give our guidance in February, so we'll update you at that point in time. But I do believe that we have momentum. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Mike Mueller with J.P. Morgan. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's two questions. Uh, first, do, do you think you'll see more acquisition opportunities over the next few years compared to what you've seen over the past, you know, five or ten? And then the second question on development, redevelopment. Uh, what, what do you see as the average spend level for the next three years? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll answer. Um, I'll let Brian take number two, but I'll answer one. I, I do listen. I think a company like ours has been always structured, built, financed to buy high quality uh, retail real estate. You know, has obviously been our primary focus. So it's hard to know whether it'll be similar to what we've done. The, you know, the last five or ten years. Um, but, um, you know, there there will be opportunities for us to grow. We really haven't done much of any acquisitions since uh, the TRG deal, which was, you know, um, if I, I can still remember that, you know, it was in the height of, well, it was a week, two weeks before COVID. And then Bobby forgot to tell me, he should have known because, you know, he has those assets in China, but he forgot to tell me about COVID. But um, it worked out for everybody involved. But um, so it's really been a while. That doesn't mean that we're not, you know, looking, paying attention to it, but we're being, you know, very thoughtful about um, what what we would like to buy and at what price. And I would tell you um, that's not going to change but I do think there'll be opportunities as we go forward. Um, but uh, it's, it, again, it's hard to compare it to, you know, five or 10 years ago, but, but uh, I do think over time we'll grow, you know, through, uh, through acquisition. Um, go ahead on the pipe. And Michael, I think as you think about the development redevelopment pipeline, you heard David talk today about four, there's about a $4 billion shadow pipeline. We've got a billion two committed. You know, I think you're going to continue to see us committed for a billion and a half a year. That could, you know, ebb and flow by a couple hundred million on either side, just given the size of the projects and the delivery of the projects. So we, we do see uh, that level of investment available to us over the, uh, in, in the future. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Our next question is from Ki Bin Kim with True Securities. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, just going morning. back to ShopSimon.com, um, can you just provide some high-level parameters on uh, the progress you're making, um, the traction you're gaining, and uh, also curious about the back-end logistics side of it? If you're, you know, are given the multiple brands we have. Are the shipments being consolidated, or is it still, you know, each individual retailer sending shipments? Yeah, just I'll answer that first. I mean, look, we're, we're early days, and you know, in using um, Shop Simon for um, uh, delivery. You know, remember it's mostly a marketplace, but we think over time that'll be a service that we'll be able to offer through the uh, Shop Simon. Um, app or website. Um, 
and I would say we've had remarkable growth in our GMV. Um, we just rebranded it, so you know, um, and I, I, I'm only hesitant because we do have a partner in that, and I'm not sure I should disclose that to you. Um, but we've got um, a meaningful growth in our GMV there. Um, and now that we're going to use our brand and our, as Brian mentioned in his marks, you know, our 25 million email list and add loyalty, we think the, there'll be more retailers on, which will add to GMV, which will add to the, um, the overall volume of the, of the site. So I'm just going to be cautious, Kim Ben, because, you know, we have a partner there. So the good news is we're making a lot of progress and we've got real traction. We've got um, a number of retailers. I don't remember exactly, but Brian or Tom can tell you after the call. Um, but I'll hold off on the GMV right now. You know, maybe at some point we'll be able to disclose that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Ron Camden with Morgan Stanley. Uh, hey, just a quick one for me. Um, just looking at the sort of the domestic NOI growth, almost 5%, which is pr pretty strong. Uh, in the past, you sort of made some comments about next year um, sort of hitting that 3% number. Just just curious to get some updating comments on, on what you're seeing on the ground and any sort of differentiation between the traditional mall and outlet business as well uh, would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, listen, I think um, overall they're all kind of moving in that direction. So uh, I appreciate you trying to get us to disclose our 25 comp NOI growth. Uh, we will do so in February. We're... Um, just going through the phase of that now, which is, as I mentioned to you, we did the malls this week. We do the outlets and the mills next week. But we're, we'll absolutely, um, you know, uh, share that with you uh, with our year-end earnings in early Feb. And, um, but, again, I think the momentum that we're seeing um, over the last couple of years continues. That, that's the important point. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I'd like to hand the floor back over to David Simon for any closing comments. Okay, thank you. I appreciate all the questions and interest, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. If we don't talk, it'll be you know, a good holiday season. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.